Hello students, let us see what the ENT questions of the INI set May 2023 were. So we could recall three questions from the year, three questions from the nose and one from the larynx. So let us quickly see what these questions were. So starting with the first question, this has been a eternal favorite of your INI set exam. So this is been repeated many number of times. Arrange the structures of the artery pathway in the sequential order of sound transmission. So yes, what is being asked is the order of the auditory pathway sequence. So this is, we know we cannot just forget it. This is the cochlear nerve. Then we have the cochlear nuclei and then we have SLIM, S-L-I-M. S is the superior olivary complex, L is the lateral lemniscus, I is the inferior colliculus and M is the medial geniculate body. Now here we know that uh, from the cochlear nerve, the nerves go to the nerve fibers, go to the cochlear nuclei and from here most of the fibers they cross. They cross to the opposite side and some also follow the same side. Now the crossing occurs through the trapezoid body. The trapezoid body, these transverse fibers are in the trapezoid body and then we have slim SLIM. S is the superior olivary complex. So, pure olivary complex, then we have the lateral lemniscus and then we have the inferior colliculus and then we have the medial geniculate body and ultimately the appreciation of sound occurs in the auditory cortex that is the superior temporal gyrus. Now, here two more questions from the auditory pathway have been asked repeatedly and I and I said and yes, one of them is that what is the center for stapedial reflex? So, yes, the center for stapedial re reflex is the superior olivary complex. This is the center for stapedial reflex. And here, the interconnection between the eighth nerve and the seventh nerve occurs through which stapedial reflex occurs. And another important question that has been repeated here is that what is the first area of the artery pathway from which the localization of sound starts? So yes, the artery pathway is responsible for the localization of sound and this starts first in the superior olivary complex. So this is also the superior olivary complex. So let us see what the answer here is. The cochlear nerve, so this is one. Cochlear nuclei, this is 4 and then we have superior olivary complex, that is 2. Lateral lemniscus is 5, inferior colliculus is 3 and medial geniculate body is 6. So, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, okay. So, that is the first choice, 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. So, the answer here is A. So, coming to the next question. So, now not only has in this question been repeated multiple times in INI said, the same question was there twice in this paper and yes, only the language was slightly changed. So, let us see what the language here was. Arrange the order of the waves of Vera in the sequential order of their appearance. So, we know that what is Vera? Brainstem evoked response audiometry. This picks up the impulses which are traveling in the auditory pathway. So, the auditory pathway is what is asked in this form. So, yes, again it is the same. We know that cochlear nerve is first and cochlear nerve produces which waves of Vera? Will you be able to tell me? Yes, it produces both the wave 1 as well as wave 2 of Vera. So, first is cochlear nerve and then we have the cochlear nuclei that is wave 3 of Vera, wave 3, right, wave 3 of Vera and then we have Again, SLI, right? Superior olivary complex is wave 4. Lateral lemniscus is wave 5. So, the cranial, the cochlear nerve is 1 and 2. Cochlear nuclei is 3. Superior olivary complex is 4. Lateral lemniscus is 5. And inferior colliculus is 6, right? Now, and also wave 7. So, Vera actually has seven waves but we usually consider the first five waves again here a repeated question of finite set is that wave five is produced from where from the lateral lemniscus and the most prominent wave of vera is yes it is again the lateral lemniscus and that matches the hearing threshold the level the sound at which the wave five appears that is the threshold of hearing of the patient that uh, so let us see what the answer here will be again it will be but obvious it is a, right? It is 1, 4, cochlear nerve is 1 and then we have cochlear nuclei that is 4 and then we have again slim 2, 5 and 3, right? 2, 5 and 3. So, the answer again here is A. 
starting with the next question so we have here a 14 year old who is brought to the opd with a complaint that she is able to hear the sound of speech but has difficulty in understanding the words her pta and bera were inconsistent with each other with the pta being more or less normal her middle retency and cortical responses were absent what is the likely diagnosis okay now even if by reading the question you feel that maybe you are not at a diagnosis you should never panic let us see what the choices are yes the choices is microplasia malingering auditory neuropathy and cochlear autostosis and yes we know all of the choices we have heard and we know what they are okay so let us see first what is there in the question so in the question we have a child a 14 year old and what's the complaint of the child the child is able to hear the sound but child is not able to understand the words means the speech understanding is not there comprehension part the discrimination part is not there her pta and bera were inconsistent and the pta is more or less normal so the pta is normal since the pta and bera are inconsistent they are not matching with each other it indicates that bera is abnormal bera is abnormal and also the middle latency and the cortical responses are absent right middle latency is also absent and cortical responses is also absent now what is middle latency and what is cortical responses now whenever a sound stimulus is given we know how we record bera yes how we record bera is we put the electrodes all over the head of the patient and when the sound is stimulus is given the uh, the impulses as they travel in the auditory pathway they are recorded in the form of waves now when the sound from the moment the sound stimulus is given up till the first 10 milliseconds up till the recording of the first 10 milliseconds that is what we call as bera so bera is we know bera is up till where yes the auditory pathway the is from the auditory nerve the cochlear nerve up till the auditory cortex only when the sound reaches the auditory cortex the patient is able to hear bera does not record from the from the cochlear nerve up till the auditory cortex it records only up till the inferior it records only up till the inferior colliculus right so that is uh, the first 10 milliseconds from where the stimulus has been given so beyond that when the sound travels in the rest of the nerves up till the auditory cortex can we record that also yes so from the stimulus till the first 10 milliseconds is bera from beyond that that is from the 11 milliseconds to the 50 milliseconds 50 milliseconds that is what is known as middle latency and beyond that for more than 50 milliseconds that is around 51 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds that is when the sound has reached the auditory cortex that is what is known as cortical responses and this can be measured by what is known as sera sera is cortical evoked response audiometry right okay so now by reading the question we are not on a diagnosis let us see whether we can exclude and come to the diagnosis because all the things that are given in the choices we have an idea about that so what is the first choice first is the microplasia what is microplasia yes we know that in microplasia the complete cochlea the complete inner ear the membranous as well as bony labyrinth is absent it is not developed at all now can this patient be microplasia when there is no cochlea at all will the child even be able to hear no will the pta be normal no not at all the child will be totally deaf so no th this cannot be microplasia at all it cannot be microplasia now let us see the second choice malingering can this be malingering now in malingering what happens yes the patient wants to show that the child that the patient is not hearing at all is yes, malingering usually 14 year old we will not suspect that the patient the child is malingering but still okay let us suppose that the child is malingering or the patient is malingering what will the patient do yes in the subjective test like pta or whenever we are asking the patient whether the patient is hearing or not patient will totally refuse that no i am not hearing at all i am totally deaf whereas the objective test like bera objective test like the middle latency like the cortical responses all of them will be normal they will be present because the patient is malingering whereas in this case it is just the opposite the the pta is normal whereas the objective test are abnormal so this cannot be malingering also now the third choice we have is auditory neuropathy okay we will come to that in a while and the fourth choice is cochlear autostrosis now in cochlear autostrosis what are we expecting 
Yes, autosclerosis, first of all, this is not the age for autosclerosis. We know it occurs in 20 to 30 years. Okay, now let us suppose that by chance this is autosclerosis. Okay, now what happens in co cochlear autosclerosis? Yes, the inner ear is also involved, so there will be cochlear hearing loss. Can you tell me any other condition where there is cochlear hearing loss? Because of involvement of inner ear, there is hearing loss. Yes, that can be autotoxicity, that can be uh, noise trauma. Yes, there can be pressed by cuses also. There can be cochlear involvement leading to uh, hearing loss. So in these patients, is the PTA normal? Yes, and is the complaint of the patient that the patient is able to hear sound, but the patient is not able to understand what happens whenever there is cochlear autostosis? Because the inner ear is not quite normally functional, the threshold of hearing will increase. Yes, the patient will not be able to hear the normal loudness sounds, but it will never be that the patient is able to hear, but the patient is not able to understand, right? When the patient, uh, um, patient's cochlea, the outer hair cells are damaged because of noise or because of water toxicity what happens the patient is not able to hear properly from that ear but is, does the patient ever say that i'm able to hear the sound but i'm not able to understand no that that will never happen and in cochlear autosclerosis the pta will not be normal it will show sensorineural hearing loss also uh, not only uh, also yes the beta will be affected yes the middle latency on the cortical responses why will they be absent they will not be absent so they cannot be this cannot be cochlear autosclerosis so what we are left with is artery neuropathy so even if you do not know exactly what artery neuropathy is yes we know what the answer here is the answer here is artery neuropathy and whenever such a question is given believe me that never will happen that if you're not able to come to a diagnosis by reading the question you will not be able to come to the diagnosis even by exclusion so always try that method out never panic yes okay now what is artery neuropathy what do you understand by the name artery neuropathy yes the name tells us that it is a neuropathy of the artery nerve which means that there is some retrocochlear hearing loss now in retrocochlear hearing loss is there a problem in comprehension of sound is there a problem in the discrimination of sound Yes or no? Is there a problem in speech discrimination? Yes, we know that discrimination of sound is a function of the nerves. Whether the patient is, whether the person is saying pin, thin, rin, sin. So exactly what word is being said, there is a problem in understanding that. That we have seen whenever we do speech audiometry, what happens in retrocochlear hearing loss? Yes, there is rollover phenomena. Even if we increase the loudness of sound, the hearing goes down, right? Okay, so that we know that these discrimination of sound is a property of the nerves. But what is this condition where the PTA should be normal? Usually in retrocochlear hearing loss, what are we expecting in PTA? There should be sensorineural hearing loss, right? But this is a condition where there is the PTA is normal, the beta is abnormal. Why should the middle latency and the cortical responses be absent? Yes, and at the same time, what is the complaint of the patient? The complaint of the patient is not the patient is hearing less. The patient is able to hear the sound, just the sound, yes, but the patient is not able to understand the speech, right? So what is exactly artery neuropathy? Now, what happens in artery neuropathy? Earlier, this artery neuropathy was just known as artery neuropathy. Now, the name has been changed to artery neuropathy spectrum disorder because it is not just one area that is involved in exactly... We do not know also that exactly whenever the patient has artery neuropathy spectrum disorder, and only one part is involved or multiple areas are involved. So what happens is that there is damage from the level of the, it can be from the level of the inner hair cells till outer hair cells, everything is normal. The damage starts from the inner hair cells up till the auditory pathway, right? Up till the complete auditory pathway, there can be damage anywhere or there can be damage at multiple areas. Now, what is the damage and why does the damage occur? Now, the damage can occur both in children as well as in adult. Now, when we say that from the inner hair cell up to the artery pathway, there is damage. What can we think in a child that is leading to the damage? Yes, the, the cause can be the cause can be either in children. It can be congenital, right? It can be congenital. Congenital means it can be the prenatal. In prenatal, what can you think? If the child is born deaf because of prenatal causes when the child was in the womb, yes, the most common we can think of is genetic, genetic causes, yes. Or it can be because of maternal infections or maternal mother has taken autotoxic drugs, yes, maternal. 
Now, the cause can also be postnatal. Postnatal we call as acquired, right? Now, in acquired causes, what can happen after the birth of the child that the child, child's inner hair cell and the nerves have got damaged? Yes, what can happen? Either there is hypoxia, hypoxic damage. Hypoxic damage occurs very commonly in prematurity. In prematurity, what happens in prematurity? The lungs are not properly developed. So that leads very commonly to hypoxic damage of the artery nerve. Yes, there can also be along with uh, uh, prematurity leading to hypoxic damage. There can be acute respiratory distress syndrome leading to hypoxic damage. There can be carnitrous hyperbilirubinemia. There can also be uh, autotoxic drugs if these are given to the patient. So now what happens because of these conditions is that the there are two main changes that occur in the nerves, right? The first is that there is extensive demyelination. There is extensive demyelination of the auditory nerve fibers. And second is there is loss of accents, loss of accents. Yes. Now here, uh, usually the auditory pathway, auditory nerve has multiple nerve fibers, around 30,000 nerve fibers. So multiple accents are damaged because of either genetic causes or because of acquired causes. So can it occur in adults also? Yes, in adults also we can have, de we can have demyelinating conditions like multiple sclerosis. So in them also, whether in adults or whether in children, here in the question we have a child, right? So we are thinking of either the congenital or the acquired causes, which would have led to extensive demyelination of the nerves and the loss of, loss of access of the nerve fibers of the artery pathway. Now, ultimately, when this occurs, what happens is that some fibers are well myelinated, some are some has demyelination where the demyelination has just started, some has more of demyelination some uh, the loss of accents also some are totally gone some are in the process of going so ultimately all this leads to a total dyssynchrony the nerve impulses which happen the hearing the understanding of speech that happens only when the nerve impulses are synchronized here because some fibers are transmitting the nerve impulses very slow some the extensive demyelination has occurred they are not transmitting at all or the extensive are transmitting it very very slowly so ultimately what happens is to, there is a total dyssynchrony the synchronization does not happen and the synchronization is very very important it is required for understanding complex sounds like speech so the patient will not be able to understand speech but will the patient be able to hear sound Yes, there is demyelination and there is lots of accents, but totally complete. The artery nerve or the artery pathway is not completely destroyed. So the transmission is occurring. Now, when the transmission is occurring, why are we not getting the middle latency or the cortical responses or why is the beta abnormal? Yes, because the impulses are not synchronized. So they are not able to elicit a beta response, the wave of the beta. They are not enough. They are not robust that they can be picked up by the electrodes. Same for the middle latency, same for the cortical responses but then why is the PTA normal what is the sound that we give to test pure tone audiometry yes we give pure tones we do not give speech we do not do not give speech and we see whether the patient is able to understand or not we just give a tone at a particular loudness of a particular frequency and we see whether the patient is able to identify just hear the tone or not so the hearing part because the transmission is still occurring it is not completely stopped but yes but it is not enough for the understanding of speech and it is not even enough, not robust enough that the uh, beta waves or the middle latency or the cortical responses can be elicited, can be picked up, can be recorded. Yes. So that is why when we test the PTA, the sound the patient is able to hear, but the there will be abnormality in the beta, in the cortical responses and in the middle latency. Is that absolutely clear? Have you understood this? Now, does this question make sense? Yes. So, yes, it can occur in adults also. So, yes, this is a 14 year old and exactly these patients complain, come with this complaint. The child is not performing well in school and when you get the PTA done, the PTA is normal. It is not always necessary that the PTA will be normal. We know that the damage starts from the inner hair cells level. Yes. So, 
uh, and there is also a decrease in transmission nerve impulses of the auditory pathway. So there can be sensorineural hearing loss also. But the hearing loss that is shown by the PTA is never so much that you can think that you can imagine that why is the patient not able to understand at all? So it is exactly it is not matching at all. The PTA will show that yes, there is hearing loss. Even if it shows, it can be normal. It can also show hearing loss, sensorineural hearing loss which can be, suppose it is 50 decibel or even if it is 40 decibel, even if it is 60 decibel, a 60 decibel sensorineural hearing loss, patient will be hearing less, but even it is not that the patient will totally not be able to understand sound at all. So when the patient is not able to understand sound at all, it means that the discrimination of speech has been severely affected and that can occur when there is a gross loss of the nerves, either because of demyelination or because of loss of accents. So that is what is the auditory neuropathy. Is that clear? So now this question makes sense. So the answer here is auditory neuropathy. So coming to the next question, a South Indian male cattle breeder, okay, so it is South Indian male cattle breeder presents to the OPD with a complaint of epistaxis. The examination of the nose is as shown below. A biopsy was taken and the histopathology appearance is also given below. What is the likely diagnosis? Let us see what the examination of the nose is showing. So what we can see that in the examination of nose, we can see a red vascular polypoidal mass coming from the right nostril. Okay. And let us see what the histopathology is. So yes, in the histopathology, we can make out that there are multiple spherical things. Yes, what are these? These are the multiple sporangia which are containing multiple sporangiospores. Yes, so this is the typical finding that is seen in rhinosporidiosis. So does this appearance of the nose also match with rhinosporidiosis? Yes, in rhinosporidiosis what we see is in the nose a mulberry or the strawberry mass. The strawberry here, usually strawberry contains the black dots, right? Here what is the appearance of the dots? On the vascular mass, it is white dots. Yes, the white dots are the sporangia of this organism. So, yes. And does the history also match with rhinosporidiosis? There is rhinosporidiosis seen in South India, more common in males. Is it seen in cattle breeder? Will the patient present with epistaxis? Yes, this is a red vascular mass. Patient comes with epistaxis. Is it seen more commonly in South Yes, so what is this caused by? Rhinosporidiosis is caused by Rhinosporidium seabury and we know that this is an aquatic, aquatic protestant protozoa. So when we remember that this is aquatic, this helps us to remember three things. First that this will be seen wherever there is more of waters, more, more of stagnant waters, more of water bodies. Yes, so that will be more common in north or south. Yes, that will be more common in south. Right. Second, how did the patient get it? Through infected waters. Aquatic tells you that it has got from, from where? From infected waters. How did the water get infected? Through the dung of cattle, which means that always there is a history of taking bath in ponds frequented by animals. Yes. So, in ponds frequented by animals, in infected, infected ponds. Yes. So, is the history matching? Yes. Can it be a cattle breeder? Yes. Cattle breeders, they take very commonly their cattle for cleaning purposes and for giving them a bath in ponds in stagnant waters. And yes, this work is most commonly in males. This work is done most commonly by males. So everything is fitting into the uh, into rhinosporidiosis. Yes. And I told you that we have to remember three things. Three things come to our mind when we remember it is aquatic protozoa. Yes. First, it is it will be seen more common in where there are aquatic, where there are more of waters that is south. Second, that there will be history of taking bath in pond frequented by animals. So very commonly it will be seen in people who give such history or in cattle breeders. And third is that because it is acquired by infected water. Yes, so it is not specifically only going to affect the nose. So there can be involvement of multiple areas. There can be involvement of oral cavity, of oropharynx, of the conjunctiva, of the external genitalia. Yes, so all these can be involved. And the patient but comes with epistaxis. Why? Because the mass in the nose is extremely vascular. 
and that bleeds very commonly. So the main complaint of the patient, which brings him to the OPD, is epistaxis. So everything is fitting into rhinosporidiosis. Do we have that in the choice? Yes, we have in the choice rhinosporidiosis. Yes, let us see what the other choices are. Yes, the first is nasal polyp. Can this be nasal polyp? Yes, is nasal polyp vascular? No. It is nasal polyp specifically seen with this history of South Indian of um, cattle breeder? No. It, does the nasal polyp ever present with epistaxis? No. Nasal polyps are not vascular. They never present with epistaxis. So this cannot be nasal polyp at all. Second choice we have is hemangioma. Can this be hemangioma, a vascular mass presenting with epistaxis? Can be hemangioma, yes. But uh, will the histopathology match with hemangioma? In hemangioma, we will see multiple blood vessels. Yes, we are not going to see disappearance and it has no predilection for South Indian or for cattle breeders. So, no, this cannot be hemangioma. Rhinophyma, what is that? Yes, that is a potato nose. Is the appearance in rhinophyma a vascular mass? And will it show this appearance of sporangia with sporangia spores? No, that is the hypertrophy of the external nose of the sebaceous glands of the tip of nose. So this cannot be rhinophyma also. So the answer here is rhinosporidiosis. This was a very start question. Now coming to the next question, identify the nerve block in the following figure. Again, this has been repeatedly asked in your INI set. So now what we are seeing here is the area where the local anesthetic is being given. We know it can, this area is the area of the ophthalmic. It is the area of either the intratrochlear or the anterior ethmoidal or the nasociliary. Any of these we are blocking when we are giving an anesthetic here, right? Now let us see the choices. The choices are sphenopalatine, nasociliary, anterior ethmoidal and greater palatine. So intratrochlear is anyway not given. So that is out. So we have to decide whether it is a nasociliary or an anterior ethmoidal block, right? So, is what is the nasociliary? What is the anterior ethmoidal nerve? Now, yes, is the anterior ethmoidal nerve a branch of nasociliary? Yes, the uh, the uh, face when we talk about the sensory nerve supply, it is totally incorrect to remember it as ophthalmic maxillary mandibular. This is not the way you have to remember and this I told you multiple times that what you have to remember is like this. It is ophthalmic maxillary mandibular. When you remember it like this, ophthalmic maxillary mandibular, you make two major mistakes which have been repeated question of your exam. First, the tip of the nose. Yes, the tip of nose, if you remember it like this, it comes to be at maxillary, whereas it is not maxillary, it is ophthalmic. And second is when you remember this like this, mandibular, the angle of jaw. The angle of jaw is not by mandibular, it is by greater auricular nerve, right? So do not remember it like this. We have to remember it like this, ophthalmic maxillary mandibular. So this is the area of the ophthalmic. Where is the ophthalmic nerve? Yes, ophthalmic as a name, it will supply the eye. So yes, it gives three branches which enter the eye through the superior orbital fissure. We have the lacrimal, we have the frontal. The frontal gives the two branches. This is the supraorbital and the supratrochlear. And we have the nasociliary. Yes, nasociliary. Yes, as the name, it gives ciliary branches and nasal branches. What are the nasal branches? The nasociliary will give the posterior model branch, which will enter through the posterior model foramen. It will give the anterior ethmoidal branch and ultimately it will supply the dorsum of the nose in the upper part that is the intratrochlear right the posterior ethmoidal and the anterior ethmoidal pierce the lamina preparatia and they enter into the nose they supply the lateral wall of the nose and then they go through the cribriform plate up till the septum and then they come, come to supply the septum now the anterior ethmoidal anterior ethmoidal uh, it ultimately, after supplying the lateral wall of the nose, it comes out at the junction of the nasal bone and the upper lateral cartilage. It comes out here to supply the uh, lower part of the dorsum of the nose, this one, right? Which means that when we are saying that this part of the nose is supplied by the ophthalmic, which branch of ophthalmic is it? Is It is the nasociliary. Exactly which branch of nasociliary is it? Yes, the upper part is by the intratrochlear and the lower part is by the external nasal branch of anterior ethmoidal, right? So whenever we have to do local procedures in this area, in involving this area of the dorsum of the nose, or when we want to anesthetize these nerves, how can we anesthetize the intratrochlear? Yes, for the intratrochlear, what you have to look for is the medial supraorbital rim. This is the medial or supraorbital rim. So at the medial end of the, where the eyebrow ends. So where is the eyebrow ending? This here. So at the medial end of where the eyebrow is ending, that is the area where you inject the anesthetic for blocking the intratrochlear nerve. Is that very clear? Whereas if we are giving 
the anesthetic here, which now are we blocking is we are blocking the external laser branch of NT8 model. This again has been a question. This picture was given in your INI set again. Okay. So now if we are giving the anesthetic like this, what are we blocking? We are not giving the anesthetic at the medial border. Anyway, the uh, medial border of the eyebrow and anyway intratocular is not in the choice. So we have to choose between nasociliary and T8 model. So for blocking the nasociliary, what is the procedure? Yes, we uh, inject the anesthetic one centimeter above the medial canthus, right? So one centimeter above the medial canthus that somewhere falls in between, in midway, midway between the medial canthus and the eyebrow. So one centimeter above the medial canthus, we inject the, uh, we inject the needle we pass it deep around 1.5 centimeters deep and we inject the anesthetic that will block the nt model right so around 1.5 centimeter we will go deep to block the nt model and then we go further one centimeter deep and we inject the anesthetic and that is what is the blocking the that will block the posterior model right so whenever we do this we block the nt model and the posterior model, so complete nasociliary is blocked and that will give a very complete anesthesia of the nose of the areas that are supplied by the nt the posterior model, the infratropic, everything will be blocked when we are blocking the nasociliary. So yes, whenever, now what do you think that when we are giving this, when the picture that is given is this, what should you mark? Should you mark nasociliary or nt model? We know for both of them, we will have to inject the needle like this only. Yeah, so whenever we are injecting the needle like this, how do we know that we have just uh, injected, we have just reached 1.5 centimeter deep and we have just blocked the nt model or we have gone further 1 centimeter deep and also blocked the post eighth model that is a complete case of ciliary. So always when both are in the choice, always the better answer will be nasociliary block. Right. If nasociliary is not there in the choice, that was a question when nasociliary was not in the in the choice in your INI set where the same picture was given, then yes, you can mark NT8 model. But if both are there, then yes, always the better answer is nasociliary. So the answer here will be nasociliary. So do we also know how the sphenopalatine block is given and how the greater palatine block is given? Yes, the sphenopalatine. The sphenop, we have the sphenopalatine fossa here and in the sphenopalatine fossa, do we know which nerve comes? Yes. Tell me. Yes. From the foramen rotundum, we have the maxillary nerve coming into the sphenopalatine fossa. Here it gives multiple branches. It gives the nasopalatine branch to the nose, which enters through the sphenopalatine foramen into the nose. It goes medially into the nose. Here it is appearing as if it is going so palely. Let me just rub it. So through the sphenopalatine foramen, it will enter into the nose and it will also give greater palatine, which will come down through the sphen through the greater palatine foramen, it will enter into the palate, it will supply the palate and then it will again uh, come up and also give some supply to the nasal septum, right? So how do we block the nasopalatine nerve? How do we block the greater palatine nerve? In other words, how can we block the sphenopalatine ganglion, which is in the sphenopalatine fossa? So to block this, we can either inject the anesthetic from here through the greater palatine foramen into the sphenopalatine fossa or what we can do is we can block the nasopalatine nerve where it is entering into the lateral wall of nose through the sphenopalatine foramen or we can inject the anesthetic through this foramen into the sphenopalatine fossa to completely block the sphenopalatine ganglion, right? So let us see how we can do that. We know that the sphenopalatine foramen is present one centimeter behind the middle turbinate. So we take a cotton swab, we, uh, we soak it with anesthetic and we place it one centimeter behind the middle turbinate that's the area of the sphenopalatine foramen where from where the nasopalatine or the sphenopalatine nerve is entering into the nose. So we can either place this applicator soaked in anesthetic over the sphenopalatine foramen area for 10 minutes or we can also inject anesthetic through the foramen into the fossa and if we are doing this. What are we doing? Yes, we are either blocking the greater palatine nerve to do procedures on the palate or on the oral, in the oral cavity or what we can do is, what we can do by putting an acetic here is we can also block the sphenopalatine ganglion in the sphenopalatine fossa. We just saw how the anesthetic, how it is the greater palatine foramen is connected uh, to the sphenopalatine fossa. So we now know all these choices and yes, the answer here will be nasociliary block.
So the next question we have here is a 22 year old female came to the OPD with a swelling on the left side of face. She has a history of traumatic injury with wooden stick two months back. CT of the nose and paranasal sinuses show normal sinuses and a mass in the subcutaneous tissue of left cheek. Pass and Grocott methanamy silver stain were pos was positive in tissue biopsy. What is the likely diagnosis? So here we have a young female who has developed a swelling of the left side of the cheek following injury with wooden stick. So whenever there is any injury with a vegetative matter, what should you always think of? Yes, what disease? Yes, always a fungal disease. It has to be ruled out. Yes, we have to think of fungal, fungal infection. And again, here in the question is given pass and grow cut methanamine silver stain. So any methanamine silver stain, if it is positive, be it grow cut or be it gomori. So we have to think of again a fungal disease. So yes, both these are pointing towards fungal infection. Let us see in the choices we have any fungal infection or not. So the first choice is IgG for related disease. Now what is this? Is this a fungal infection? No. What is this? This is a fibroinflammatory condition and that uh, the etiology is not known, but if at all we think of etiology, it will never be a wooden in injury with a wooden uh, stick. What will that be? Yes, etiology, if we think of, can be immune etiology. Also, never is there involvement only of the subcutaneous tissue of the cheek here. This is a multi-system involvement, it involves multiple salivary glands, pancreas, kidneys. Yes, also in the histopathology, yes, within the biopsy, we will not see all these stains positive. What we will see there will be proliferation of the lymphocytic and the plasmocytic cells. There will be infiltration with these cells and the plasma cells typically will contain a lot of IgG4 positive cells. The, the IgG4 positive by IgG ratio will be more than 40%. None of which is mentioned in the question. So no, this is not the, this cannot be the answer. Now, the second choice we have is phycomycosis. Phycomycosis, what is that? Yes, phycomycosis uh, was the earlier name given to zygomycosis and which was the earlier name which is which was given to mucormycosis. So, yes, can this be mucormycosis? Mucormycosis is usually seen in immunocompromised, no? diabetic or uh, on steroids or some hematogenous malignancies or anything. Uh, organ transplantation, non immunosuppressive drug, none of which is mentioned here. Can it still be mucormycosis? Yes or no? Yes, mucormycosis can be of five types. The first and the most common is the rhinoocular cerebral. Yes, it is seen in immunocompromised. It can be pulmonary. Again, yes, in immunocompromised. It can be gastrointestinal. Yes, again, in immunocompromised. It is seen very commonly in preterm, in malnourished, and the disseminated, which is seen in severely immunocompromised. But yes, we have another variety, and that is a cutaneous, and that can be seen in immunocompetent individual. And yes, here, the mode of infection is inoculation through external injury. So yes, this in the question, is a cutaneous mucormycosis. So the answer can be phycomycosis, yes or no? Yes, it can be. Let us see what the other choices are before 100% saying that yes, this is phycomycosis. Natural killer T cell lymphoma and midline lethal granuloma. Yes, both these are actually the names given, different names given to the same thing. What is that same thing? Yes, it is known as the Stewart granuloma or it is known as midline lethal granuloma or T-cell lymphoma or natural killer lymphoma, is the etiology of this an external injury with a wooden, wooden stick? No, what is this? This is an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And yes, what you see here is extensive, extensive destruction of the mid-facial structures. Why? Because there is extensive angioinvasion leading to extensive necrosis. So there is extensive involvement, erosion, there is necrosis of the mid-facial structures. So when we get a CT scan done here, will the CT of the nose and PNS show normal sinuses here? No, it will show extensive involvement of the nose as well as the paranasal sinuses. Also, these stains here will not be positive. Here, this will show T-cell antigens. This is associated with the natural killer or the midline lethal granuloma has association with Epstein-Barr virus and T cell antigens will be present there. So no, this cannot be natural killer or midline lethal granuloma. So the answer here is phycomycosis. So coming to the next question, match the features seen due to compression of the following structures in a case of thyroid swelling. So thyroid swelling compressing the trachea, esophagus, sympathetic chain, Recurrent laryngeal nerve and we have to match it with hoarseness, Horner syndrome, dyspnea and dysphagia. Yes, so this seems to be quite a simple question. Yes, in thyroid swelling can then be uh, 
compression of the trachea yes and compression of trachea will lead to what it will lead to dyspnea three right okay esophagus can it be compressed yes that will lead to yes dysphagia sympathetic chain can a thyroid swelling compress the sympathetic chain rare but yes it can so that will lead to horner's syndrome and recurrent laryngeal nerve yes it can be compressed and that can lead to hoarseness so we have 3 4 2 and 1 3 3 yes we have 3 4 2 and 1 we have another with 3 3 4 but it is 1 2 no so the answer is answer is b and this was i think very very simple so that brings us to the end of the ini set recall and yes many of the questions were repeat questions and they were very simple except for one question the auditory neuropathy where the child was hearing the sound but not able to comprehend the sound that appeared a little tricky when he just read the question but yes if you do not panic see the choices at least you can come to what the answer is by exclusion so i hope you were able to answer all these questions before me